Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malika Harris. I am here interview, interviewing James West, Dr. West. I'm going to give you a little bit background of myself. Like I said, my name is Malika Harris. I recently graduated salutatorian of my class at Detroit Collegiate Preparatory High School at Northwestern. It's a long title. <laughs> um, in the fall, I will be attending Eastern Michigan University, majoring in marketing. And during my internship here at the USBTO, through the work-based learning program, Urban Alliance, we were researching famous black inventors we wanted to interview. I became aware of James West as part of my research here at the USPTO. James West, who invented the microphone, attended Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he earned his bachelor's degree in physics in 1957 before working for Bell Labs. After an accident with a radio he tinkered with, West became intrigued with the concept of electricity. He knew he wanted to pursue his interest in science academically, although his parents preferred him to become a physician. In 1960, while at Bell Labs, West teamed up with fellow scientist Gerhard, Gerhard Sessler, to create the microphone. In 1999, West was the fourth African American selected to join the National Inventors Hall of Fame for the invention of the electric microphone. In 2006, he received the U.S. National Medal of Technology. The microphone, commonly called a mic, is a transducer that converts sound into an electrical signal. Microphones are used in many applications, such as telephones, hearing aids, public address systems for concert halls, and public events. It can also be found in motion picture production, live and recorded audio engineering, and television broadcasting. Good afternoon, Dr. West. Yes, you did a good job there, and thank you very much. Um, the um, only thing that I might add to that is uh, to to that that uh, may be important is that um, uh, it's um, life can be great fun when you follow your star. So to you and the rest of the audience. Um, don't be afraid to be fixated on something that you know very little about because the information is out there and you can learn and get it. Thank you very much, Mom. So well, should we start the questions now? <laughs> okay, first question we have, Dr. West, is how did you maintain your confidence after losing the support of your parents in order to move forward and become as successful as you are today? I think part of my answer to that question was in, in the remark that I just made, but let me let me elaborate a bit. Um, uh, and 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 this is particularly true for underrepresented minorities and women. We're frequently told that we're reaching much higher than we should be. We're not tall enough to reach the, the apple, so don't worry about it. No, that's not the way to approach this find a stick or something that can increase your height and your ability to, to get that apple that you've been told that you could not reach. It is common to dissuade people, um, and uh, I had plenty of that, but when you find something you like, it's, it's like, um, I don't know, like candy maybe. Once you taste it, it tastes good, and you want more, and you want more, and you want more, and, and basically that's what happened to me in, in, in science. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And so uh, 
uh, I think that uh, that the combination of those two is, is answers that question. Yeah. I love the metaphors. Okay, second question is what events led you to envision the innovation that resulted in the creation of the microphone? That's a very interesting question, and it is because I had no vision. Um, and and very well, when when I said I had no vision, what I meant by that. The assignment that I received as as an intern at Bell Labs was pushed me in a certain direction in, in acoustics. And uh, I took that information that that formed the question that had nothing to do with the microphone, but the equipment that I needed to solve the problem that I was given led me to look more into charge storage and transport and polymers. And the reason for that was that something worked that should not have worked. It would take me a long time to explain it uh, if, if I pull this thing apart, but just imagine the, the uh, uh, capacitive transducer is some sort of driving element. The, these are headphones that I'm talking about. And you have a capacitive sensor and that sensor needs a bias. And what happened was when I took the battery out, the thing was not supposed to work, but it still worked. And so the question mark came at that point. What's going on here? What is nature trying to say to me? This thing should not be working, but it is. And, 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 and that led me into looking into uh, an area for which I knew nothing about. That's really interesting. Okay, third question. I know that you have over 260 patents and you are still inventing today. Can you share with us any information about your most recent innovations? Thank you for that. I, yeah, I love to talk about what I'm doing now. Uh, because I think it's very, 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 very important um, and will become even more important in the future. And that is a device, you know, the stethoscope has been around for 200 years. But if you look at the first stethoscope and the most modern one, other than, than the one that we're working on, there's not much change that's gone on with that instrument. It still does basically the same thing. I got involved with, uh, with um, the project with the stethoscope because pneumonia takes between a million and a million and a half infants lives each year, and it's a curable disease. So what's the problem? The problem is in detecting pneumonia. A well-trained person with a stethoscope is what they generally do, but there are not enough trained people to be able to listen to your chest with a stethoscope and determine if your lungs are healthy or unhealthy. We're using artificial intelligence to create a device that can listen to your chest and, and say whether you have pneumonia or not. And, and this we hope to save many, many lives, because once detected, treatment is simple to, to cure it or to get you over the, the seriousness of that disease. And so the, the uh, stethoscope that we invented is not only electronic, but there, there are other electronic stethoscopes, but this has a brain. And what we hope to do and what we're working on now, um, COPD and, and asthma are problems that greet, especially underrepresented minority groups. Uh, uh, it's a problem that, that, uh, that um, uh, we face every day. Uh, I had a high school student in my lab last year, uh, and Jalen, 
was learning about what we're doing to detect pneumonia. And what he wants to do is to reprogram the artificial intelligence algorithm to be able to look at COPD and asthma in this country. And he wants to do that because his sister suffers greatly from it. And there are no tools to help him or her or, or her parents in determining whether she should take a full dose of medicine, a half dose of medicine, or skip in, entirely. And what we hope to be able to do is to prolong the comfort of the patient by, by, by in, in individually monitoring uh, the um, respiratory system and providing the proper amount of medication to make that patient comfortable. Okay, I understand that your mother was one of the hidden figures who did hand calculations for NASA. How or did her experience influence you? Well, that's kind of a tricky story, and it is because um, um, my mother was a school teacher before she went to Langley, uh, and um, uh, she was also a, an officer for the uh, NAACP. And um, I don't remember how many years, because I was very young then, she um, uh, worked there, but she was eventually fired and she was fired because she was an officer uh, in, in the NAACP. And um, uh, Senator MacArthur had declared the NAACP a communist organization. So once that was done, if you were affiliated or a member of that organization, uh, you could not hold a government job because it was essentially, and that was not comfortable. That was, that kind of ruined her life. She was, um, not very productive uh, after that uh, firing. But uh, yes, indeed, she was a hidden figure. And, um, and, and as I understand, was very good at the mathematics that was required to make that thing fly. Okay. Did you face any obstacles or hardships that made you feel that you might quit working so we've the microphone? Nature is not kind in that it does not give you the secrets that you're working for very easily. It makes you work for it. And the answer is yes, I've been very discouraged, and, and, but I've also been well rewarded. And so even though things happen that do not go my way, I never accept that. I always push for a more thorough answer to the problem that I'm uh, that, that I'm trying to solve. And so this gives me the, the courage to get back on the rim of that glass and go around. I can fall in again, I can fall out again. But the important part here is to get up and get back on that edge and, and win. What have you found to be the most challenging step in development and innovation? The most challenging steps in, in, in any uh, innovation is to understand nature itself because it's all based there. You know, the, the, the saying is really true. There's nothing new in, 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 the, in, in the world. Um, for example, the, uh, the microphone depends on on uh, uh, charge separation in order to uh, bias the, the, the system. Well, nature does this normally. Do you know that leaves and plants have been shown, it's been shown that leaves on plants can actually receive sound. How they do it is 
is a little bit still unknown, but but they have found that if they impede impinge sound in certain frequency ranges on leaves of trees, there is a reaction by the tree itself to to that sound. So that's basically. I didn't know that. I had to to uh, when when I start started this research, but. Yeah, it, it, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, oh, 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 is that um, uh, uh, anything you do, you sit down and solve a, a, a problem in mathematics, and you get an answer, but the answer doesn't agree with what the, what the author of the question thinks it ought to be, right? So you work through that, but it hasn't come to the right conclusion. So what do you do? You go back and start over again and you try to find out where the mistake was made or where you did. And it doesn't always have to be a mistake because I have seen and where, for example, uh, a student was sitting his qualifying exam for, for PhD at a major university and he solved the problem for uh, his advisor. His advisor said that's an incorrect answer. And he couldn't figure out what went wrong. And so he talked to a group of us and we looked at it. And it, as it turned out, he discovered a new wrinkle in the algorithm. So, so if, in, in, in other words, be careful not to make the same mistake again, but also to understand what that, what, what the, 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 what you consider a mistake is not really a mistake, and 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 so you have to play these two things off. They 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 don't always come out the same way, but um, but uh, but um, if you take that approach, then. The likelihood is that somebody else, ten years from now, won't discover the real thing. You will discover it at this point. If someone would have told you that your invention will be used globally in devices diverse as telephones, hearing aids, and motion picture production, would you have believed it? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's, it's really very interesting to follow. Foresight, and you know, you, you come up with a new widget. And, you know, there, there are two types of problems. There's one type of problem which is well-defined, and you can say, okay, I can figure a solution to that problem. There are other problems by which there's no visual continuity between now and what the future may be for that. If, if, if I sit and say I need a widget that can easily um, clean my teeth, um, um, now all I have to do is worry about the mechanics. But the other problem, the other one that I've tried to describe there are no teeth, there, there no, there's no problem that you're trying to solve. In, in other words, I didn't start out by saying, I want to make a better microphone. I started out by trying to understand charge storage and transport and polymers. And once, and, and you see, the, the, this, this is um, not a new science. Faraday wrote in, in his notes that, um, that, um, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's not going to go anywhere. You know, the only only use for it is to teach students electro, how electrostatic charge behaves. And and so I, you know, from Faraday through time, attempts have been made at making a electric microphone. 
But the problem was, in, in, in all of the previous attempts, was longevity. The microphone had a finite lifetime, usually less than six months. And what Sessler and I were able to do was to extend that six months to 100 years in terms of the lifetime of the charge storage in the polymer. And so, quite naturally, it, it was obvious that this would make a, a good microphone, something that people had thought about uh, some time ago. But what that microphone could do and the advantages of that microphone were certainly not known to me. For example, people who wear hearing aids had to turn the hearing aid off when they walked because every time the heel hit the, 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 the pavement, it was like a thunderstorm going off in their ear. Now, why? Because the mass of the diaphragm before the electra was large. And so now you have this suspended mass and your heel goes down and this thing rattles and it rattles the next step, rattles on the next step. Well, the electrode microphone diaphragm can be very thin in, in the few microns, if you can make a film, the thinner, the better, right? And so now you reduce that mass from some big number to near zero or very, very small. And so now when your heel goes down, this thing may move, but it's only going to move a, a very finite amount. And so now you don't hear anything that's correlated with the, with the heel hitting the ground. Um, another um, an interesting difference is um, right now, you're not listening to my voice. You're listening to a coded version of my voice because they wanted to improve, improve the bandwidth or, or reduce the bandwidth that's necessary for the voice. So, so they do signal processing on it, right? Now, it turns out that most of the algorithms that, that process in this direction are very sensitive to distortion. Well, guess what? The electrode microphone has low or near zero distortion. Moving coil microphones, crystal microphones do not work with these compression schemes, only the, the, the electrode microphone. So you see how broad my vision would have to be in order to, to, to see what that microphone could do to improve man's ability to communicate. The interesting thing about my career was that I was offered as much as two and a half times what Bell Labs offered me, but it would be doing military research, research that could not be released to the public or to improve the the, and, and I didn't want to be a part of anything that, that would not allow me to publish results that I get scientifically, allow me to own my material, because you work for the government, the government owns it. Guess what the first application of the major application of the electric microphone was? In, in Vietnam, in the jungle, they took electrode microphones and put an FM transmitter on it, and they seeded the jungles, and now they could track the, the, the enemy as it moved through, the, through this array, massive array of, of, uh, of microphones. And that was the last thing that I wanted to happen to anything that I... Uh, that, that I worked on, namely used for military purposes. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, Dr. West, who are some inventors who you feel may have shaped or inspired you? Oh, that's a very, very in interesting question. A very good question, too. 
Um, when I joined Bell Labs, because at that time, and I visited Xerox, IBM, General Motors, um, G GE, and loads of companies. But the problem I had, I, I would be the only black that I saw, only black person that I saw at those places, except for Bell Labs. And there I met and was introduced to Lincoln Hawkins. Lincoln Hawkins is also inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame and has won, been, been awarded many honorees uh, for his work. And what did he do? Well, originally telephone cables and power cables were shielded with lead. The sheath on, on cable was lead. Now, we all know that lead is extremely poisonous. And so just imagine how many people would be have exposure to lead if, if it was everywhere. What Lincoln Hawkins did was to learn how to cure polyethylene so it wouldn't degrade under ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And this allowed a very inexpensive plastic to replace lead. His patents are considered some of the most money-saving patents ever. So that's, and he wasn't the only one. There, there were other black scientists, Earl Shaw, for example, uh, who um, at one time in, had, um, his claim was the most powerful laser in the world. And I could see him shooting holes in metal with that, uh, with, with that laser. Um, uh, so um, my, um, my choice of Bell Labs is not based on what they paid me. It was based on what I thought I could see a path of where, I, of where I could be what I wanted to be because I had a model in front of me or models in front of me who preceded me. And so my first question to Link Hawkins when I met him, would you be my mentor? And he agreed. He says, I'll teach you everything that I know. And he did. And here I am. I think I followed his footsteps very well. So, uh, yes, that's a very important question and one that we all ought to look at when we get to the point of looking for employment. So the microphone has impacted our world in many ways, I'm pretty sure many more ways than you would have imagined, Dr. West. Considering the big impact you've made thus far with the microphone, is there something you wish you would have added? Say it again. Is there something you wish you would have added? Uh, I'm adding now. Uh, and let me, let, let me um, give you a, a good example. The, the modern stethoscope depends on a microphone to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy so that you can, can hear it, right? Now, stethoscopes are required on airplanes. Every commercial airplane should have a, is required to have a stethoscope. But nobody can hear a dead gum thing over that stethoscope because the noise level in the airplane exceeds the, the level of the sound coming from the body, right? Now, can this problem be solved? Can you solve this problem? And the answer is yes, we're solving that, the, that problem by the following means. Microphones are made to match ear because that's the environment that they, that they work in. And so even though you try to shield that microphone from external sound, some always gets in through the diaphragm, through the rubber hose, sound will get in. But now, what if I created a sensor that was, was insensitive to airborne sound, but extremely sensitive to motion? 
And that's what we've done. We've built a, a, a capacitive sensor that has a characteristic impedance of salt water, which is 90% of what our bodies are made of. And so now when I put that on, on, the, on the chest, I don't have to do any signal processing to cancel out the, the ambient uh, uh, sound. It does it automatically. So, yeah, I'm inventing new sensors uh, as, as we go. By the way, this also has a, a potential application in uh, energy harvesting. Uh, we all have PDAs that run out when they should have energy when they shouldn't. And uh, what if I could build something in the shoe that every time you took a step, you generated a, a small amount of electricity, which is stored somewhere in the heel of the shoe. And now you can plug your, your cell phone in if you get short on power. It's not going to power it very long because it, the devices are rather power hungry. But as the requir required energy comes down, then more and more devices, and, and that's the trend. That's the way they're, they're working. Uh, um, uh, in integrated circuits require far less energy to run than normal circuitry. So, uh, and, and this is because they don't have the wires that leak and so forth. Everything is compact and built, uh, built correctly. Uh, so, yeah. Are there any topics of interest that pique your curiosity? Maybe something that's out of in innovating or innovating itself or anything? Every day, everything I read. Um, uh, science is, 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 is always a learning process. I, I mean, if I don't learn something new today, I'm, I haven't fulfilled my responsibility to myself. And so I make it a point to try to learn something new every day, to try to understand something new every day. And this, in many cases, just means I'm reading papers that are written by other authors on, in fields that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, new, new directions, yes. You know, uh, COVID-19 has taught us a lot of lessons if, if we, we're very careful to listen to them. And, and one which was mishandled and it, and it created a, a paradox that still puzzles me today, and that is why some people don't think wearing a mask in, in an infected area is effective at protecting not only you, but the people around you. Now, this all came about because when COVID-19, when, when the pandemic hit, nobody was making masks except for doctors and nurses and hospitals. And, and this wouldn't, would have depleted their stock in, in less than a day, in, in hours, if, if, if everybody went out and, and bought masks. And so the government played a little trick here. They said, oh, masks are not really that important. And some people took a hold of this and still fight it today, still use it today as, as uh, a, a, a um, um, hogwash, as, you know, the government is, is messing with us. No, they're not. Now, this should never happen, should not have happened in the first place, and it should not happen again. And so the National Institute of Health and Many other government funding agencies are looking at this and what the void that it left. We don't make anything physically in this country anymore. We'll build a few cars and stuff like that, but everyday items that are necessary to keep us alive and keep us healthy, we don't make them. They're made somewhere else. We can no longer do that because if the supply chain gets broken, then everybody hurts. If we were manufacturing masks in this country, that whole thing would have been could have been uh, avoided. So there's the good and the bad that's wrapped up in, in this. But uh, but I think it's very important to to realize that that uh, that 
uh, the lessons of COVID-19. And so different cities uh, are going to be hubs for different manufacturing. You know, some place in Michigan may make washing machines, and I'm just making this up. But, uh, but then the state of Michigan will, will, will be making dishwashers, clothes washes, clothes dryers, and, you know, the, the city of, of, uh, of uh, in some city will be designated as the hub for that kind of uh, equipment. Uh, Baltimore, for example, is slated the hub for medical instrumentation. So we have to learn, you know, no, no we shouldn't have had to have covert in order to come to this conclusion because uh, because transportation and and pandemics can wipe out your supply chain very easily and so we want to prevent that in, in the future so we we have to learn from each each thing that happens to us we have to use that to improve life for the future okay thank you dr west it was a pleasure my pleasure talking with you too at this time i will be turning it over to miss crystal Hammond. thanks malachi you did a great job i feel like this is your show and thank you dr west this this has been really really awesome beyond all of our expectations. So Mr. West, you talked about being mentored by Mr. Hawkins and many of us are mentoring the, the students that you're speaking to. So can you share with us what you think makes a good mentor? Like what did Dr. Hawkins do? What did you personally think, you know, a good mentor should do or be? A good men mentor is one who listens because it, you know, you, you have to know the problem that, uh, that your mentee is facing. So you have to be, first of all, a good listener. Then the next thing you need is to be a good problem solver because in general, uh, you're mentoring someone age-wise who's younger than you with far less experience uh, than, than, than you have. And so you rely on the experiences that you had to guide your life. But now you can use that to also help improve the quality of life of your mentee. That was great. We all need tips. Okay, so another question. So do you believe this the machine learning and artificial intelligence um, being used in a lot of cases, will this create a potential man versus machine scenario? <laughs> Uh, I'm intrigued by artificial intelligence. I'll, I'll be quite uh, uh, quite frank that um, that um, uh, you know machines can do some things far better than human beings can, right? Uh, but there are things that machines can't do. For example, if you were to hook all the cell phones in the world up to to a network and have them all working together it still would not compete with the mental ability, right? And, and I mean, it's even hard to envision all of the cell phones in the world hooked up to the same node or network. Um, uh, but the brain does that. So, uh, so um, uh, uh, we, we, have, we have a long way to go before artificial intelligence becomes a threat to man. I'm not saying that it will never be that, because in some fields it will. There are some things that are so redundant that these devices, that's what, that's what artificial intelligence is doing. It is very repeatable. It does the same thing each time. You can also make it learn, and, and, and each time it takes in a piece of data, it, it updates the algorithm because it's noted some little wiggle in the in, in, in the response that wasn't there in the previous one. So this is a part of it. What is it trying to tell us? What is it saying? And so as long as artificial intelligence is on that side of the street, I'm okay. 
Now, when it th begins to think, if it ever will, or if it ever can, then I'm going to be a little bit concerned. But then I go back to the model of the cell phone and say, no, I don't even have to worry about it there. That is true. So for now, we only have to worry about them winning Jeopardy and beating us at Jeopardy, the machine. <laughs> Um, so you have over 250 patents issued. So on, our, on average, how long did they take? Or w what, what time span does that cover? That covers my life. Uh, I got my first patent in 1962, I believe. Um, and um, um, some of them may have some value. I, I can think of a few that that have some value but this goes back to a question if I had a crystal ball that I could tell what the what the microphone would have been good for I would have probably not patented that would probably done it like coca-cola does and keep it a big secret and make it blow up if you try to open it up to get in it that way I could corner the corner the market you see <laughs> <laughs> but um that's not the case, and so. Got it. So then, so you, from going back to your thoughts on AI, what about nanotechnology? A very, very important part of, 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 of our uh, world. Um, uh, hearing aids is a very good example of that, where um, uh, my um, uh, relative who was a country doctor, became hard of hearing and uh, and I built a, an electronic uh, stethoscope back in the, this was in the 50s I guess I, I don't remember exactly chronology but but it was a shoebox hmm. that was required to to make that stethoscope based on the technology at that point okay uh, hearing aids is some big lump that's set in the back of your ear with something coming in. Now, my brother showed me his new hearing aid, which is uh, totally invisible. He puts a thing in and you, you, you don't know it's there. I mean, there's no way to see it because it's so small. And this all comes about because of integrated circuits. And, and so, yeah, it's a very, very important part of our advancement. Oh, that's cool. Um, so do we have any other, that was, those were most of the questions, um, and from the students. A lot of these questions are from the students also. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh, because Jaden wanted to know, so how is the patent of the electroacoustic transducer shared between you and Dr. Sessler? Electro a good, a good, good question. Um, 50-50, I think, is, is, is the best way that I can put it. Um, uh, you know, you sit down in a group of room, uh, a, with, with someone and, and you begin to raise questions. Look, I just don't understand what, the, what's going on here. And so collectively you solve the problem. But now it, it is because of things happen in a dynamic sense. It's not so easy to go back and say, well, I contributed this, my, my colleague contributed this. So we never argued over that. We never, and, 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 and over the years, I've probably collaborated with more than 200 people. And um, I, this includes students, so I may be exaggerating a little bit there. But um, in no case have we ever had a dispute over over who did what. You know, we in, in the cases that I described, we solved the problem, and that's what we started out to do. Once we achieved that, we were both happy. All, all of us were happy. Cool. Well, we are very appreciative of your time today. Um, we, we cannot thank you enough for this opportunity and um, providing us with all of your knowledge great stories, anecdotes, and we are ready for those walking uh, chargers. So students, get ready to walk to earn your charge for your phones. 
And thanks, Malachi, again. And, and thank the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for setting this up. I enjoyed it. Um, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you somewhere down the road. And so have a good rest of the day. And goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.